I'm Brett Stevens of the New York Times with um, my friends uh, Bill Crystal and Juan Zarate. Brett, thank you. Uh, we have a very diverse panel. Um, Juan is a graduate of Harvard College. Bill is a graduate of Harvard College. Um, Juan went to graduate school at Harvard uh, with a degree in law. And uh, Bill went to graduate school at Harvard uh, with a degree in uh, political science. Um, Grand diversity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Bill worked for George H.W. Bush, and uh, Juan worked for George W. Bush. <laughs> so this is really going to be um, a very vigorous debate we're going to have uh, from the stage. Uh, don't worry, don't worry. You can tell that University of Chicago resentment is coming out here. I'm just saying it's a great place, Chicago. It's really a fun place to be in college. <laughs> Where fun goes to die. Um, <laughs> So uh, I'm going to skip the introduction since we have all of 29 minutes. And um, really, the subject is global order and, um, and, and disorder. And I think it's an important subject because I think many of us feel, wherever we are um, politically, uh, that the world is undergoing something of a nervous breakdown. And I think it behooves us to try to understand um, why that is and whether uh, there is uh, a cure for it, or whether we're going to, in a sense, have to go all the way down in order, or find bottom in order to start to um, uh, rebound. Now, part of this nervous breakdown is connected to the election of uh, Donald Trump, um, but some might say that Donald Trump's election uh, hasn't been so much the cause of this as it was um, a symptom of a series of, of, of uh, trends. Uh, and there's a, I think that there's also a school of thought that you know, one of the reasons we've had a, a breakdown in, in, uh, in uh, global order, a sense of breakdown in, in global order, is because of the overreach of uh, past administrations. People say that, in a sense, it all began with a um, terrible decision to um, invade Iraq and to extend American power beyond its, um, its proper uh, reach. So I'd like, I guess, to start with you, Bill, to sort of provide us um, in, in a couple of minutes um, a kind of a sense of how, how is it that we got to this, this moment where the, the kind of the certainties that I think we carried with us into this century have all sort of vanished. Uh, well, it's good to be here, first of all, with uh, all of you and Richard and Juan and, and Brett, um, people I very much admire. Juan served really well in the George W. Bush administration, was key in putting sanctions on Iran and, and North Korea. And I think the Iran sanctions actually is one of those cases where we were, had a policy that was on the verge of success and gave it away under President Obama, which does get to the point that we've not just uh, Donald Trump, I'm not for Donald Trump. I think his foreign policy uh, instincts are not good. I think he's got good people around him, hopefully, who can channel him. But uh, eight years of President Obama did his damage, especially the second term. I think when historians look back, and s the first term with Gates and then Panetta, with Hillary Clinton actually as Secretary of State, uh, Petraeus, Mattis, people like that at CENTCOM, I would say there were things I didn't agree with, obviously. But on the whole, it was sort of still a kind of reasonable foreign policy. This, the catastrophe of the second term, beginning with Syria, uh, and then spiraling into the weakness that was shown repeatedly in not standing up to Putin, not standing up to China, I think put whoever had become president would have had a tough situation to deal with. The only thing I'll say that's favorable to Donald Trump or extenuates Donald Trump is that if Marco Rubio or Jeb Bush or whoever you like, Mitt Romney, were president today, he would have a tough world to deal with. More broadly, just very briefly, I mean, I think we got very complacent as a country. Uh, elites got complacent. The public got complacent about the world order we live in. We took it for granted. It's been going a long time. The Cold War ended surprisingly well, and suddenly in the 80s, I came to Washington in 85, figuring you know, I was excited to come. I had been an assistant professor. I was going to spend the next 10, 20, 30 years as part, I hoped, of you know, Republican administrations, Reagan, Bush, et cetera, or writing like Brett and doing other things as part of the Cold War fight. We forget how unexpected that victory was. And then we kind of coasted on that momentum. But to be fair, Clinton and certainly George W. Bush did some things to build a kind of post-Cold War order or to keep, let's say, an American-based liberal world order reasonably strong. But, but we got awfully complacent about what the world would look like if we chose not to, if we chose to pull back a little bit and not to exert ourselves either diplomatically or militarily. And I think we've always, 
It was always probably more tenuous than we thought. You know, world orders are not, the natural state is disorder. So if you have 70 years of reasonable world order, you should say, you know what, there's a lot to be learned from that. We shouldn't fritter it away. We shouldn't gamble with it. There are things that have to be changed and updated. But don't have a cavalier attitude towards it. And don't think it can't fall apart pretty quickly. And final point, when these things fall apart historically, they don't fall apart you know, necessarily incrementally, 5% a year over 10 or 15 years. They fall apart a little, 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 and suddenly off a cliff, right? I mean, the world looked okay in 1913 or spring of 1914. There were little wars, there was some disorder in the Balkans, people were worried about a rising Germany, but basically, you know, these were all manageable kind of things, and suddenly you get a cascade of events, and you have World War I. I don't think we're quite in that situation, but I think what worries me the most is that we are restraining the system, so to speak, both in terms of, in many, many ways, and in ways that could lead beyond headaches to a real spiraling out of control of a liberal world order, spiraling out of control in the sense of authoritarianism, getting awfully strong in the sense of nuclear proliferation, in the, strength of state, in the sense of straight, state sponsors of terrorism uh, being uh, strengthened. And so you just, we do not want to live in that world. And we've avoided it, but I worry that we're, we can't avoid it forever unless we take actions to continue avoiding it. I, two, two things, Juan. Um, first, do you agree? Uh, is there anywhere you disagree with that assessment, I guess? And the second thing is, you know, we feel, it, it, you get the sense that we have sort of crossed some Rubicons mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. In North Korea, I remember President Bush at a State of the Union saying we will not allow the world's most dangerous regimes to acquire the world's most deadly weapons. Well, a few years later, North Korea tested a nuclear device, and now they're on their sixth or seventh test. Nothing has stopped there. Um, I Iran... Uh, developed a, a robust uh, nuclear capability before the, the, the Iranian deal. Is it, as someone who spent time sort of devising sort of systems short of war to contain these regimes, do you, do you think that the, the work that you did, for instance, on, on terror financing or, or proliferation financing, can that work be replicated now, or are we going to have to stop these regimes in some either accept them or stop them in a much more dramatic and bellicose fashion? Fascinating and important questions. First of all, thank you. I want to thank Richard for the invitation to be here. It's really an, an honor to be up here with these two gentlemen uh, whose work I've read for years, and so really a pleasure. Um, let me answer your first question first, Brett. Um, I agree with Bill that we're in a period of a sense of dislocation where norms are being challenged, <coughs> if not superseded where the question of what American power should look like and what its bounds are are completely in question. Um, and where, to your point on the second question, it, it appears and feels like we are, we've moved beyond the bounds of the expectations of power and those norms. And so um, I think where I would disagree slightly is I, I think regardless of uh, who's president or what the policies are, there are some macro level factors at play in terms of globalization, shifts in power, that we're already going to put stresses on the system uh, and have uh, sort of manifested themselves in some, some interesting ways. And, and let, me, let me just articulate those in, in, in a second, and then I'll answer your, your, your second question more concretely. The first is it feels like the, the map of the world itself is shifting, right? You have the South China Sea with China literally creating islands and shifting the maritime domain. Russia altering uh, the landscape in Europe and Ukraine. Terrorists erasing borders in the Middle East. Um, the virtual communities are rising. You know, the, the Facebook community is larger than uh, the population of, of India and China. Um, and so the, so the map of the world is shifting before our eyes. The sense of power and how power is wielded is different now, right? So you have asymmetry of actors, so individuals, networks, groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS have global reach potentially. Uh, even isolated countries like North Korea, the Hermit Kingdom, um, are toying with asymmetric capabilities, both hard and virtual. You saw the New York Times piece talking about what they're doing in the cyber domain, which is a. You a, believe what you read in the New York Times? <laughs> I do. I, I've been worried about, I've been sounding the alarm bells with respect to Glad. both North Korean and 
uh, Iranian capabilities um, in cyberspace, in part because what you have in the, in the global disorder is the demonstration effect among the rogue actors as to how to influence strategically and with reach and capability. Um, and they learn from each other. Part of it is uh, North Korea and Iran learn from each other in terms of development of WMD programs. They watch capabilities as to what they could do in the cyber domain. They learn from each other in terms of how to profit from illicit economies. Um, and it's state and non-state actors alike. We, we were talking about Russia earlier. Um, it's the ability of state actors as well to use non-state actors to cloak their activity or to, to give them reach. And so the, the nature of, of the map is shifting, the nature of power is shifting, and the question of what is America's role in, in maintaining the norms and, and order, all of that is in play now. Um, and, and to your question, then, how hard do you fight for the reestablishment of those norms? And I think one of the challenges of the last eight years, and I completely agree with Bill, is it seemed that we articulated a defense of norms without actually defending those norms. And so on proliferation, we weren't actually willing uh, to punish Assad for the use of chemical weapons. Um, with respect to the development of nuclear and uh, missile uh, programs outside the bounds of international expectations, there have been no consequences for North Korea. Um, and so I do think there are ways of using power, absent kinetic force, that can constrain behavior, that can influence strategies. But the more that you allow actors to break the bounds of those norms, the more that demonstration effect becomes a global norm, a new global norm, um, the more difficult it is to use non-kinetics to reorient those uh, expectations. And so I'm, I'm, I'm both pessimistic and op optimistic, pessimistic in that I think we are in a period of great dislocation without strategic aim, optimistic in that I think we have the power uh, within our means and the innovation to actually solve a lot of these problems if we're a bit more strategic about how we deploy our tools and our capabilities. Bill, I want to ask you, you know, you, you talked about the catastrophic second Obama term and the critique of that term, I, mean, I wrote a whole book about it, it, was that America was in retreat. Great book. Um, but I have to ask myself, and I have to ask those who sort of bought into the analysis, well, how is it then that having diagnosed that the problem was a retreating America, we um, elected as president a man who, at least rhetorically, um, and in some ways substantively, has sought to hasten uh, that retreat, has sort of turned it into more of a full-scale route. I mean, you can argue he's on, on one policy or another he's been at least uh, more um, outspoken, but the, the, what McGovern's Come Home America theme was in 1972 is in some respects not that different from Donald Trump's America First what are we doing with NATO? Why aren't the South Koreans defending themselves? I mean, so how, how was it that, what's your, what's your analysis of the American electorate that they looked at what had happened in Obama's second term in terms of the world and thought the cure is Donald Trump? You know, there, I'd say this, there are two alternatives to sort of what Obama's excessive belief perhaps in some international institutions, very great reluctance to use force a certain kind of withdrawal of a, uh, an embarrassment about America's exercise of power and so forth. One reaction would be, I think, the one we've all written about and would embrace. Let's call it an old-fashioned Reaganite <coughs> liberal internationalism. Uh, the other would be America first. I mean, it's, and it's happened historically. If you look back at the 30s, for example, the reaction to retreat and to appeasement, one of the reactions was a kind of it's a sort of pseudo tough reaction, right? You know, I mean, Obama, I mean, Trump sounds like the opposite of Obama, and he does do the opposite of Obama in some cases, in some cases where we might agree with him because we also have been critics of Obama. But it's in this framework of, uh, you know, we've got to take care of ourselves, we've got to uh, forget about you know, free riding allies and so forth. Maybe we didn't do a good job of explaining. I come back also to just the complacency, though, the sense that you don't, what would a world look like without NATO that's functioning, without <coughs> the US Japan alliance and the alliances in Asia? I mean, people just have not, and Trump 
people hadn't had much imagination about that. Uh, the good news is the system is pretty strong in the U.S. It sort of constrains Donald Trump, I think, in many ways. He hasn't actually gone to an America First policy, really. There's an awful lot of feints and, and damage that can be done around the margins. So far, I guess, if you step back, if you came down from Mars and nine months into the Trump presidency, NATO exists, the Asian alliances exist, the defense budget's exactly what it was. Uh, he's not doing as much as I would like to strengthen the U.S., God knows. There's some erosion around the margins. What I think is very hard to tell is we're only nine months in, and how much erosion will there be, and also how much damage is he doing to the American public's understanding, which wasn't great before, or else Trump wouldn't have won, and, uh, as to how important this world order, I mean, our central role, I, you know, I, and in some ways it comes down to a very simple thing, I think. I, don't, I believe without the US consciously being willing to assume the central role of maintaining and preserving and extending the liberal world order. And that's diplomatically, economically, and militarily, uh, it starts to crumble. And I don't think there's any alternative balance of power. You can have all these fancy theories, but at the end of the day, it's about us being central to it and being willing to embrace that. And I think it's bad when neither party is really now f uh, committed to that. Juan, you know, one of the themes that um, Trump uh, um, likes to uh, press is that our, our allies are feckless. They don't contribute. Uh, they barely spend enough money for their own defense, and yet here we are putting American soldiers' lives at risk from you know, the Bal you know, the, 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 in the Balkans or the Balt in the 90s or the Baltics today. Um, so you, you as a, a deputy national uh, uh, at, the, at the NSC, security you're, you're advisor, yeah. deputy national security advisor, uh, what would you say about that criticism? Is it a valid one? Or do we really, is there some utility in Trump saying, hey, unless you contribute, we're, we're not playing, playing this one-way game here? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a fair concern. And frankly, it's continuity from the Obama uh, sort of uh, thematic uh, that was very similar to the, to the Trump uh, thematic, which is there needs to be a division of labor in the world uh, where the U.S. can't be the world's policeman. The, the, the U.S. may have to be central in terms of, of international norms, but it can't solve all problems at all times. And so it needs partners to engage. And I think um, that's, that's a fair concern and criticism. What I think is, is unfair and, frankly, unfortunate is uh, both the tonality and the approach, because uh, these are not countries that, that are doing nothing. Um, you know, in the counterterrorism world, that, which I know best, uh, the, there are uh, numerous countries who have fought and died alongside our troops, whether it's special operations forces or infantry, intelligence services that work very closely with ours, intelligence services that have put their lives on the line uh, in concert with us to, to counter uh, threats that, that are emerging. So I think, I think it's, it's absolutely fair to say, look, our partners need to share the burden. It actually may be a more dynamic model for how you think about defense and, and other types of arrangements. Uh, we need to think about uh, more dynamic national economic security by spreading the burden of, of how we think about uh, you know, corrosive Chinese investments, and that can be shared. You know, there's all sorts of creative things that can be done from it. I think what's, what's problematic is the accusatory, accusatory tone uh, that in some ways belittles what countries have done and are willing to do, especially in the face of very real risks that for our allies are immediate and in some ways existential. So you look at the Russian problem for our Eastern European allies, that is very real and immediate. And so to, to say with a, with a blanket sort of statement that you're not doing enough is to them to say, look, you're late to the game. We've been sounding the warning bells for a long time. Or to say to the South Koreans and Japanese, you need to do, do more with respect to North Korea. And say, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> this, is, this is the threat on our doorstep. And so, um, again, I don't object to the, to the idea. And in fact, from a counterterrorism perspective, one thing to keep in mind is we began to move to a regional model as we thought about how Al Qaeda was metastasizing, how regionalization of terrorist groups and operations were happening, that there needed to be a more regional approach to how we were combating, containing, and ultimately disrupting the problem with the French in West Africa, with the Ethiopians, 
the, and, uh, and the Kenyans in East Africa helping the Somalis, with the Australians and the Indonesians and Malaysians containing the problem in Southeast Asia. And so there are dynamic ways of dividing the labor, but I think um, as my mother, Cuban mother would often say, no es el qué, es el cómo. It's not the what, it's the how, right? It's how you express it and how you say it. Well, let me add one word to this, because I just think we, know, we need also to have pride in what we've done over 70 years, though, and this is a huge problem. I mean, we have a domestic policy. Globalization and technology put pressure on wages and jobs in all kinds of ways. Uh, the wars didn't go that well, especially in Iraq with Secretary Rumsfeld and the failure to send troops and others not finding WMD, obviously. Other things, I think we recouped it with the surge and we're in decent shape by the end of 08, but then we got out of Iraq and, and it's all tough and difficult. And both in domestic and foreign policy, we're very used to indulging the public sense that things are bad. And they maybe, you know, I mean, I, somebody, somebody argues with Trump voters in 2016 and, you know, we, we need someone to go in there and blow the place up. It's like, really? I mean, yeah, it can't get worse. It's like, really? I mean, have you read any history at all? Or have you looked at America just 20 or 40 or 60 years ago? I mean, we're not talking about ancient history or the, the much as I love Xenophon, you know, the Anabasis or something. We're, we're not talking about World War I or II even. I mean, we think of Korea, Vietnam, think of the threats from the Soviet Union. I mean, we need to be to say things are a lot better than they could be and then they were. The trade, I mean, the demagoguery on trade is unbelievable. Two billion people came out of poverty, basically, in the last 25, 30 years in India and China or on their way out of poverty, out of horrible poverty and what really looked like you know, this cultural revolution in China, famine in India, uh, because of an international order, economic order and defense order, you've written about this, Brett, which we were at the heart of. They deserve a huge amount of credit. Everyone else deserves credit. But no one's willing to make that case. When Hillary Clinton walked away from the TPP, which is itself not that important, obviously it doesn't, didn't get passed and we're still trading a lot with Japan and India and Australia and all these countries, but when she walked away from that, that was a moment, I think, where we were not willing to say to our own voters, which what presidents and candidates of both parties have said for 50 years under pressure from all kinds of protectionist elements and in the middle of recessions, much worse than anything we were going through in 2016, we're willing to say, look, we need to basically maintain a liberal order of free trade. And no president, and both presidential candidates walked away from that in 2016. And if I were the prime minister of Japan or India, I'd say, geez, I mean, that's just a little thing, but if they can't even defend that, <coughs> that it, when there's 4.5% unemployment, and you know, what, 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 can, what are they gonna do if there's an actual conflict? And how far you. is Japan, therefore, I mean, it's not an accident that you then get the rise of a kind of populist nationalism in India, for example, and in other countries around the world. And that's where it can really spiral out of control. So we need domestically to make the case for what we have accomplished and to take pride in it. Otherwise, I think they're kind of reluctant, don't want to, don't want to task, you know, stress the American public too much. We can find a lot of people to help on everything. That's fine. It's a practice. In some ways, it's, it's the real world. We have to deal with it. But you need an overarching spirit, I think, of pride and confidence that we don't have right now. Let me, let me uh, put this question to both of you. Juan, why don't you start? We now have a situation where at the State Department, the, 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 the assistant secretary level goes virtually uh, unfilled. Um, and there's a real personnel crisis, it seems, in government. Explain to us why that should matter. I mean, there's a certain view, certainly, I think, in, in the Trump heartland, like, what do these guys do other than shuffle papers and make themselves important and take expensive trips to, to stupid summits in Vienna that nobody, you know, that don't amount to anything? So why should, that, why should that work matter? And how is it affecting the quality of decision making and the ability of the United States to be an effective actor on the world stage? It's a great question. I, I think actually one of the failures of leadership in recent years has been to articulate why American foreign policy actually matters in the heartland, right? Why it matters to everyday citizens. And your question is a reflection of it. Our diplomacy matters and our diplomats matter, especially at that level, because they not only are exponents of our policy and our, and our values, but they're the ones who are setting the expectations and the roadmap with our friends and allies, as well as our adversaries and competitors in the context of our defense policy, our economic policy, our, our, um, our, our diplomatic reach, our cultural sort of, uh, sort of expectations. The, the, the diplomats 
you know, aren't the only exponent or agents of, of American power, influence, or values, but they are important markers and agents for it. And to the extent that you have temporary folks or uh, people who are denuded of, of real power, um, there's a lot of question uh, among our allies as to what is the policy? What are the expectations? Because in the international order, there is still an expectation that the US is going to set the ground rules, is going to set the expectations uh, for, for what's to come, whether it's with a crisis or a long-term strategy. Um, where I see the biggest deficit, because I think the, the current foreign policy is a tale of two cities. It's, there has been some really interesting policy on things like Afghanistan, Iran, North Korea, um, even Afghanistan, where, where the new administration has obviously countered what the Obama administration has done, is actually set forth, you can debate it, but it's a, it's a rational policy, versus what seems to be uh, an absence of policy. And this is where a lack of trade policy, a lack of where the US is going to be in setting relationships long term uh, will be. And, and this is what I would say to the American citizen is, if you think that the current order will simply continue without our active engagement, of which our diplomats are a key part, then you are sadly mistaken because there are others in the international domain, both state and non-state, who are trying to define the norms who are trying to take advantage of the international system and frankly are trying to displace American power and influence. And I, a great example of this is what are the tech standards for data privacy and sharing around the world? Who's dictating that now? China is beginning to dictate what those rules are looking like. Are we comfortable with that? Maybe we are, maybe we're not. But we'd better be conscious about what that looks like and be very cognizant of the power that we're using to influence those norms and that behavior, uh, or else the Chinese and others will define it. I mean, I would say that and there's a fair amount of waste. There's certain stuff hasn't been modernized nearly enough in certainly the State Department. I'd say that's probably true in the intelligence agencies and throughout the US government. Uh, but the solution to that is not to sort of you know, if you, I mean, it's, what signal does it send to the American public when Rex Tillerson, this CEO of one of the great American companies, comes in and really, in a, in a very stupid way, decides, you know what, I gotta cut the State Department. Does Rex Tillerson have any idea whether the State Department needs to have 14,000 Foreign Service officers, which is what they have now, 13,000 or 18,000? Would anyone go take over a business and just say in a blind way, you know, it looks fat to me, there are too many conferences? I mean, they, but what signal does it send? Well, the guy knows what he's doing. He's a big CEO. Obviously, there's just an unbelievable amount of waste and stupid, stupid stuff there. And who cares for their assistant secretaries of state? 14,000, is that really for the world US responsibilities? Is that such a huge number of foreign service officers? Talk to people in the military, and the number sounds sort of big, one and a half million. But let's talk about how many troops we could actually deploy compared to what we could do. I was in the first Bush White House. We had the Cold War, the Cold War ended, <laughs> thank God. We had the Cold War Army, which turned out to be very useful, you know, in the first Gulf War. Did we need to have 500,000 troops in Saudi? No, we ended up not using most of them. We were wildly outmatched Saddam. But you know what, it didn't hurt. I mean, if that's the price we pay, is a little bit of excess capacity. Now we're doing the opposite. I was talking with one retired four-star the other day. He said the biggest thing that the leaders, civilian leaders, haven't really come to grips with yet is we're so used to being able to do it, you know, at the end of the day, even the surge, we have the capacity to do what we need to do. He's worried that, leave Trump aside, the American, whatever, whoever the American president is will call in his generals and say, hey, we got a real problem here, and we need to send two aircraft carriers here, but we also want to beef up things here. And the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is going to say, sir, we, we can't do that. Let and me, that is not something that Americans are used to, and that is very, very dangerous. This is a really important point, because I think Part of the role of, of diplomacy, as well as military and treasury officials and others, is to, to maintain the balance, if not to manage potential conflict uh, as it simmers, right? right? The U.S. government, you know, we've been in, in the White House, in the sit room, you can only manage two, maybe at most three major crises at once. You want to avoid the moment where you have to deal with fourth, the fourth or fifth crisis uh, of the day. And you look at what's happening around the world. You've got the, the challenge in Kirkuk. You've got what's happening in North Korea. You've got potentially renegotiation of the JCPOA with Iran. Uh, you've got uh, Russia issues. Uh, you've got the Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE split. 
who's managing all of these things? And, and if you don't have empowered diplomats to actually speak on behalf of the Secretary of State and the President of the United States, it gets very hard to manage these issues as they simmer. Uh, and next thing you know, you're dealing with multiple crises instead of managing situations uh, more reasonably. We're going to turn it over to the audience for questions, but one, one quick uh, question for you, Bill. Um, since we were talking about Xenophon and the Greeks uh, <laughs> earlier, uh, what does it say about a country that Donald Trump is the president? What does it say about the American Republic and, and, its, and the health of the American Republic? I mean, I think we'll be able to answer that more honestly in five years in this sense. Like anything, it was a bizarre, it was an odd election. He had 16 opponents. He was incredibly lucky to have Jeb Bush as his primary foil to start off with because if you have a public that wants change after 25 years, feels like things haven't gone that well, especially for middle class, working class families. Uh, and then it's sort of like, hey, and guess what? You're going to have a choice between the wife of the president, who was, of a man who was president for eight of those years, and the son and brother of Bushes who were president for 12 of those years. Uh, and you want change. I mean, Trump was incredibly lucky. Then he had a skillful campaign. He's a good demagogue. It tells him, so I'm depressed that his demagoguery worked as well as it did. But on the other hand, for me, the test is, does, it, does he get reelected? Does, does his message? You know, do a lot of Trumpy senators and congressmen emerge, or is it kind of a one-off? So the, the I, and I can make a case that it could be a one-off. The most depressing thing for me: 45% of Democrats in the primary voted for Sanders, 45% of Republicans voted for Trump. I, I'm not comparing Sanders and the different in many ways, different problems, but basically those are both statements of deep unhappiness with the status quo and with the way things have been. Uh, in my view, statements, uh, endorsements of pretty irresponsible policies and economics as well as foreign policy. Now, not everyone who voted for Sanders is for what Sanders really is for, and the same with Trump, obviously. There's a lot of protest votes, and there's a lot of just symbolic voting and random voting. But what does that say? I mean, it was not like we're in the middle of the Depression. It's one thing if you have Huey Long almost becoming president or Father Kaufman becoming terribly popular in the middle of the Depression. It's another thing. It's one thing if after a world war, a country just is exhausted and can't deal with things. 2016, is it really? That worries me, that the public is so susceptible to demagogic appeals of left and right. And I think, incidentally, five years from now, we may be as worried about the Sanders phenomenon as the Trump phenomenon, or some third phenomenon. You, you mentioned this before offstage, I mean, where it's, you know, Trump fails, but does that mean that people go back to be for Marco Rubio? <laughs> or does that mean people decide, you know what, Trump was, had the right instincts, but he just wasn't tough enough. He didn't go far enough. He wasn't really willing to take on the establishment. You can go in a very dangerous and a very bad way, I think. The feckless republic. Um, let's uh, ask, invite the audience to ask uh, questions. <coughs> yes. I mean, this is a big question. I think it can't just be patching, it can't be nostalgic, it can't be splitting differences. Sometimes you do split differences in the real world, obviously. There has to be a fresh thinking through, and I, I think both really and also in terms of perception, easier said than done. I myself, if you had asked that question six months ago, I would have said, you know, I think we can save the Republican Party still from Trump. I am honestly, and I'm just you know, saying this uh, out loud here, but I'm not sure that that is doable at this point. I am really unnerved by the degree to which the Republican Party has been willing to accede to Trump, and to some degree to Trumpism. We'll see what happens in 2018 in these primaries of civil war we're about to have in the Republican Party. Um, Democratic Party, I would have hopes for as well, but I'm not happy about the trends there either. Could you have a third party or an independent candidacy in America? I think it's less impossible than people think, but it's still uphill given American history. So it's a real challenging moment. I mean, to your point about the Republic, it's, it's in bad, it's not in great shape. It's a challenge. It's a test of the citizenry, test of the institutions. Um, so I, I think, but I think that's the right question. That is the task, I think. Another question? Yes, sir. So if, uh, if part of maintaining world order is, is, is necessarily getting into situations like Korea, uh, Vietnam, and in Iraq, uh, what in your view, I, this is a huge question, but I, I think it was Christopher Hitchens said something about people don't realize that when something doesn't happen, something else happens. So had we not gone into to Iraq as quickly as you can, what problems could we be facing now that could be, say, worse than what we face with, with Iran and with, uh, and with North Korea? And, well, 
We had, say, Saddam with nuclear, we <laughs> having reconstituted his nuclear weapons program, you know, and even more proliferation uh, in the Middle East, and, and a jet, even rap, more rapid sense of U.S. weakness. Let me answer just quickly this way. When I, I was a kid, I worked at the Hudson Institute, which was then up in Hudson. <laughs> One forgets that it was once on the Hudson, that's why it was called that, up in uh, uh, about an hour north of here. And for Herman Kahn, I was in college, my first year in college, just research assistant doing total, you know, very, very mechanical tasks for him. Herman used to have this uh, many fantastic speeches that he would give, and uh, many of them uh, Castro length, you know, he was really an amazing character, amazing thinker. And one was, he, he went on at some length about this. What if they had stood up to Hitler in 36 when he invaded this, when he took back the Sudetenland? What if Britain and France had gone in? They would have defeated Hitler, I think, and he, his government probably would have fallen. It would have been total chaos, though. I mean, it wouldn't, there was no obvious solution there, you know? It wouldn't have been like, hey, okay, everything's great. The Czechs and the Germans will divide things up neatly. It, and there's the middle of the Depression, and it would have had a spillover effects, and it could have been a very messy five or 10 years in Central Europe. And it could have had even, you know, minor <coughs> Milosevic-type ethnic cleansings and so forth. And people might well say, geez, I mean, what, that was rash. That wasn't necessary to go into the Sudetenland. That doesn't prove that every intervention is right, obviously, but it does remind one of how you don't know the alternate case. You really don't know the history that didn't happen. And um, so that's where I'd say that. And we don't take, and we, this is again, we, we take for granted, the, 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 this is sort of Juan's point, the problems we've prevented. I mean, I, when you're in government, you sort of see how close you have come to things going awry. And Pakistan getting nuclear weapons, total disaster. We sort of let it happen. If we really let it happen, it happened. it happened. Once it happened, there almost was a nuclear war between Pakistan and India. That was a pretty aggressive American diplomacy to stop that. Pakistan remains a huge problem. AQ, without AQ Khan, you don't have a North Korean program that's as far along. Mm -hmm. You don't have an Iranian problem that's as far along. This is another point, I'll just very quickly. I mean, these, letting things go badly, bad in one part of the world affects other parts of the exactly. world. You don't get to compartmentalize this. Exactly. A, there's genuine just proliferation and lurk among these bad actors, they learn from each other, exactly. and they learn from the example of each other. Someone told me that, I don't know, I'm no expert on Asia, but why don't you, you guys correct me. China, I'm told, it's pretty reliably reported from within the you know, inner sanctums of the Chinese regime. They watched Putin go into Ukraine. They watched Syria, first of all, in the red line, nothing. Putin goes into Ukraine, huge amount of talk, a few sanctions, nothing, basically. And they decided in 2015, you know what, we could start building those islands. Mm -hmm. And Obama will huff and puff a little, and you know, John Kerry will say a few things, but we're gonna get away with it. So they did the first one, huffing and puffing, nothing. They did the second one. So this is where the weakness is contagious, mm -hmm. and it's so dangerous, I think. And, and corrosive, they even lost a le an international legal case with respect to the islands, and nothing's happened as a result. So the very institutions that you rely upon to constrain the power begin to get corroded by the, the overreach. Um, just if I could answer this real quickly, because you can be a fan of, of the decision or not to go to war with Iraq, uh, but the reality is there were, there were externalities that came from it. So Libya actually gave up their nuclear program uh, after that, because they assumed the United States was coming there next. Yeah, now, who knows with respect to what would have happened in Libya, but Libya at the height of the Arab Spring may have looked very different with a more developed <coughs> nuclear or chemical weapons program uh, still uh, in place. Iran was said, said to have stopped its program. The, the National Intelligence Estimate said that they decided to stop their program uh, when the US went into Iraq. Um, that changed the, the thought and calculus in Tehran with respect to whether or not to move forward as aggressively with their nuclear program in that period. Did that affect negotiations? Maybe it did. Um, Tony Blair talks about the, the effects of action and the effects of inaction. And I think we've got to be very humble about both, um, but realize that uh, absent American action in helping to shape norms uh, other actors are going to reshape those norms. Uh, but, and, and that's part of what's happening now. Let, let me go back to this the, the lady in the front row's question. So how do we reconstitute a center? I mean, it seems to me that there was a kind of a pedagogical failure on our part, and I mean really, in a sense, the three of us and the views we represent, in that the case for American power uh, was never really effectively made to the public. And I can understand why, because it's very easy to see costs and very difficult to see benefits, because we take the benefits for granted. Mm -hmm. 
and the costs, of course, appear, you know, weigh on us, weigh on us heavily. So I think that those of us who, who take the views that we do have, have a kind of a responsibility for rethinking how you go about making the case not only for an engaged, muscular American foreign policy, but for uh, a non-demagogic politics, uh, a kind of a more enlightened form of statesmanship. I was very moved by watching Senator McCain uh, yesterday accept the Liberty Medal and, and make his case so eloquently, but McCain is, is 80 years old and, and in ill health. Uh, who makes that case now and how do we make it to a generation of millennials who, who don't necessarily grasp what it meant to stand up to the Soviet Union or bring the Berlin Wall down? You want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, it's, a big, <laughs> it's a huge question. I mean, I voted for John McCain twice in primaries. I preferred him in 2000 precisely because to Bush, because Bush was, we forget this, you know, was a sort of humble foreign policy. And I think we paid some price for that. I mean, I respect George W. Bush terrifically, but Rumsfeld, I mean, under Bush's guidance, we wanted to get out of Iraq as soon as we got in. That was the whole point. 50,000 troops, light footprint, we got to get out of there. We can't be a permanent occupying force. Um, and really, that was a, you needed a more of a McCain attitude. But the best thing about McCain's speech, which I highly recommend people read or watch, it's, you know, as you can see it from last night in Philly, is the sort of pride he takes in, you know, in a modest way, I'd say, uh, in what he, his, his contributions to what he regards as a worthwhile and successful endeavor over, as he says, 60 years of being involved from being a very young uh, officer, you know, officer in the Navy to uh, the U.S. Senator and presidential candidate in American foreign policy without the pride in the sense that we've accomplished something important and worthwhile for the world. I think if it's, it's, if it's always apologetic and reluctant, and I understand why it is, you know, presidential candidate wants to go around and say, you know what, we're going to really do a lot, we're going to have to intervene in a few places, we're going to spend much more on the military, we're going to need to beef up the State Department and the intelligence agencies. Uh, it's always kind of, I think we can do it more effectively, and I can cut stuff, but, uh, and certainly get out of these difficult quagmires, but uh, without a certain sense of both determination to prevent evils, but pride in doing good. I mean, pride that Ameri this is really not a bad period in American history these 70 years in terms of what we've accomplished around the world. It's not a bad thing for in world history. How many times has this happened where, you know, uh, you win World War II, you win the Cold War, you maintain a reasonable post-Cold War order uh, for 25 years. It's not such an easy thing, but pu the public needs to have a sense that this is uh, something to be proud of, not something to sort of very reluctantly shoulder the burden and, gee, if only we could get rid of it as soon as possible and so forth. Yeah. Um, I think we're out of time and I hope that's not a metaphor. Uh, so thank you for, for your attention.